In this lecture, we will look at how genes are expressed. Through various experiments, it was determined that genes typically code for proteins. Here's the nucleotide sequence for a portion of a gene. And within this sequence, groups of three nucleotides will correspond to a specific amino acid. A very specific amino acid. As you can see, the first three nucleotides, cytosine, thymine, and thymine, correspond to the amino acid glutamic acid. Now we all know what biological molecule is formed with the polymerization of amino acids. Yes, a protein. The specific nucleotide sequence of a gene is the recipe for a specific sequence of amino acids to eventually make a specific protein. Now remember, we show a section of a gene here. Even the smallest protein coding gene in the human genome is 500 nucleotides long. Most genes are thousands of nucleotides long. But how are the instructions of a gene converted into a protein? Well, that DNA information is in the nucleus, but cannot leave the nucleus. So a copy of the gene is synthesized with RNA. This copy is then transferred to the cytoplasm, and the information is decoded into a protein there. And these processes have certain names. When a copy of a gene's DNA is made with RNA, this is called transcription. Then, when the RNA travels to the cytoplasm and the protein is made, the process is called translation. But for now, let's answer the question, what happens when nucleotide sequences differ from each other? Take this mouse. She has a specific gene that codes for coat pigmentation, in other words, fur color. When this gene is transcribed and translated, a protein is produced that deposits enough pigment to result in a dark coat color but not every mouse has the same nucleotide sequence for this gene. This mouse has a different allele for coat color. Notice that there is a different nucleotide in this position. This allele has an adenine instead of a guanine. And because of this one small difference, we have a different group of three nucleotides, which is transcribed into messenger RNA and results in the addition of the amino acid cysteine into the polypeptide instead of arginine. So this different allele produces a different protein which results in less pigment deposited in a lighter color coat for the mouse. In other words, the different genotype has a different phenotype. Interestingly, the majority of mice in forests have the dark coated phenotype. And the majority of mice found on beaches have the light coated phenotype. Why would this be the case? Well, think of the forest mouse against the background of his home. The forest floor is pretty dark, and his dark coat would allow him to hide pretty well. But against the sand of a beach? Uh, he could be easily seen by predators. So it makes sense why we see these two different genotypes in different habitats. Let's have a brief overview of the two major steps of protein synthesis, transcription and translation. Transcription is when a copy of the gene is made. The DNA is used as a template to produce the messenger RNA, or mRNA. This copy is made by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. Translation is when the messenger RNA binds to a ribosome in the cytoplasm, and another type of RNA called transfer RNA brings the correct amino acids to build the protein. Remember that RNA is different from DNA in several ways. It is single-stranded, has ribose as its pentose sugar, and does not contain the base thymine. Instead, it uses uracil, which base pairs with adenine. The language genes are written in is called the genetic code. The messenger RNA's nucleotides are a copy of the genetic DNA sequence. Every three nucleotides is a triplet, or codon, and each triplet corresponds to a certain amino acid. As we can have one of four different RNA nucleotides in each spot of the triplet, there are 64 different possible combinations. 61 of these code for amino acids, while three are signals to stop translation. Here's a table of the genetic code. Let's find out how to read it. Say you need to find out which amino acid has the codon UCG. As the first base is uracil, we would look at the left-hand side, the very first row. The second base is cytosine, so we look at the second column on the top. The third base is guanine, 
so we look at the fourth row down for those codons that start with uracil. So what amino acid does this codon correspond to? Yes, serine. You might notice that more than one codon corresponds to serine. Not only these four, but also these two. We say the genetic code is redundant because most amino acids have more than one codon that code for it. This makes sense, as there are only 20 different types of amino acids found in living organisms. And here are the three stop codons which serve as a signal to stop protein synthesis. In addition, AUG usually serves as the codon that signals the initiation of amino acid polymerization during translation. So most proteins start with the amino acid methionine. So let's say we have a DNA molecule. We can only see three base pairs. One of these strands will serve as the template strand that will be used to make messenger RNA. Let's say this strand is the template strand. So what RNA nucleotides would RNA polymerase add to pair up with this sequence? Right, U, C, A. And since we have three nucleotides, this is a codon. What codon does it correspond to? Take a look at the table. Hit the pause button if you need more time. That shouldn't have been too hard, as it was your good friend serine. Now let's try this on a bigger scale. Here we have a hypothetical gene. You should be able to determine which strand is the template strand. Why? Well, RNA polymerase acts like DNA polymerase, as it must add nucleotides in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So which strand could be used to build an RNA strand that begins with AUG? Yes, this is our template strand. Now synthesize the messenger RNA. Again, you can pause if you need more time. Good job. So how many codons are in this sequence? Yes, six. Now write down the messenger RNA sequence as you are about to see the genetic code table. Okay, here it is. What amino acids will be in your protein? Yes, methionine, alanine, asparagine, aspartic acid, and proline. Notice that even though you have six codons, one serves as a stop codon, so the actual protein is only composed of five amino acids. Even though transcription and translation are very accurate, mistakes do happen. It is important to understand that codons must be in the proper reading frame to be read correctly. Take this DNA template strand. When properly transcribed, we get methionine, phenylalanine, alanine, and serine. But what if transcription began at the wrong place? Say, one nucleotide off. Well, that would change the reading frame. The codons would be composed of a different triplet of nucleotides. And the wrong amino acids would be translated. A point mutation is when a single nucleotide is changed in the DNA. A mutation like this may occur during DNA replication. This table lists the various types of point mutations. A silent mutation is when a nucleotide is changed, but the amino acid does not change. In many cases, if the change occurs to the third nucleotide in a codon, the redundancy of the code will keep things the same. A missense mutation does change the amino acid the codon codes for. This change in the amino acid sequence may rarely produce a beneficial protein, but usually results in a neutral or flawed protein. A nonsense mutation inserts a stop codon too early and usually renders the protein non-functional. And a frame shift mutation changes the reading frame, usually resulting in a non-functional protein. Here is a general diagram of protein synthesis. During transcription, the nucleotide sequence in a gene specifies the nucleotide sequence in an RNA molecule. For protein encoding genes, the product is a messenger RNA molecule that exits the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm. During translation, the sequence in the messenger RNA molecule specifies the amino acid sequence in a protein. The first stage of protein synthesis transcription involves DNA and RNA. One of the DNA strands is the template strand, as it contains the code for the gene. The other DNA strand contains the complementary bases for the coding strand and is called the non-template strand. A 
an enzyme called RNA polymerase adds the NTPs in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction based on the nucleotide sequence of the template strand. Three types of RNA polymerases are involved in the coding of different types of genes. RNA polymerase 1 does not transcribe genes that will result in a protein product. Instead, the RNA produced by RNA polymerase 1 will direct Instead, the RNA produced by RNA polymerase 1 will directly be incorporated into the large subunit of the ribosome. RNA polymerase 2 does transcribe genes that code for proteins, and we will look at this in more detail later. And RNA polymerase 3 also transcribes non-coding genes, like RNA polymerase 1. The initiation of transcription occurs somewhat differently in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In bacteria, a protein called the sigma subunit binds to a specific sequence at the beginning of a gene. This starting sequence is called the promoter. RNA polymerase then binds to the sigma subunit to create what is called the holoenzyme. Here is a model of the holoenzyme bound to DNA. And here we see a diagram of the holoenzyme with sigma binding to the promoter. The promoter has specific nucleotide sequences. These sequences are not part of the code, but a signal that sigma recognizes and binds to. The promoter is found upstream of the coding portion of the gene. The plus one site is where transcription will begin. The coding sequences continue downstream. In eukaryotes, many proteins called basal transcription factors bind to the promoter and then RNA polymerase binds. The RNA polymerase of eukaryotes does not bind to the basal transcription factors to create the holoenzyme. However, the basal transcription factors and RNA polymerase perform the same basic functions as the holoenzyme seen in bacteria. Now let's look at the details of transcription. Transcription is the first phase of protein synthesis. How is the information of a gene transcribed into messenger RNA? After the sigma subunit binds to the promoter region of the gene, DNA polymerase attaches to sigma to form the holoenzyme. The sigma subunit unzips the DNA helix and transcription begins at the plus one site. Then the sigma subunit is released and RNA polymerase adds NTPs that are complementary to the template DNA strand. Like DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase adds nucleotides in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. A group of amino acids in the polymerase called the zipper detaches the messenger RNA from the template strand and elongation progresses. Eventually, the polymerase comes to a termination signal in the DNA that stops transcription, but it doesn't happen automatically. As this termination signal is synthesized by RNA polymerase, the messenger RNA that peels off folds back on itself, forming a short double helix called the hairpin loop. This hairpin is thought to disrupt interactions and leads to the messenger RNA transcript completely disconnecting from RNA polymerase. 